Hello and welcome to Business Incorporated Live on Channel Television. Well, here's what's uh, coming up today. As the federal government launched the Citizen Delivery App, Special Advisor to the President on Public Affairs is going to tell us uh, how it works and we'll also count the cost of insecurity in Nigeria's uh, food inflation uh, at levels at record highs at this point. And in the metals market, gold nears a record high as inflation risk lives the safe haven uh, appeal. Well, it's great to have you join us. This is day two of uh, the public holiday. Uh, the final one is going to be tomorrow. Then we'll have um, a trading session right here in Nigeria. But we're going to track other markets. Uh, we track in the global market uh, at this time. We see all prices um, held steady in early trade uh, today after two straight days of losses as worries about tighter supply due to uncertainty over Gaza ceasefire. Um, talks were offset by a bigger than expected build in U.S. crude uh, inventories. But we see Brent now uh, below that $90 level, um, just by a little bit there. $89 for tonight cents to barrel, 0.29% um, jump. That's what we're seeing uh, for the price. And we see um, the U.S. Um, grade, that's at $85.31. Um, still at that range at this time, 0.31% uh, up. Let's get a check on the metals market now. See, gold prices held steady um, near a record uh, peak in the previous session as favorable mix of emerging inflationary risk and ongoing um, geopolitical tensions underpin the safe haven uh, metal. And we see gold futures, uh, $2,366, um, up 0.18% uh, today. And we see spot silver, 0.84%, up $28.21 uh, per ounce. We've also seen bullish sentiment with palladium and um, other metals uh, that we track at this time. So the metals market is still looking strong um, today near record highs. And the net asset value of Nigeria's pension fund has risen to 19.8 trillion naira at the end of February 2024 from 19.53 trillion recorded in January. The nation has, um, uh, the, the fund has shown um, resilience amid uh, tough economic um, conditions growing by 229 uh, billion naira. That's about 1.17 percent in one month. Uh, the fund comprises of RSA active funds one, two, three, and uh, five, and RSA retiree fund, uh, closed pension fund administrators, approved existing schemes um, fund six, active and retiree fund. Uh, besides the membership of the contributory pension scheme, also increased to about 10.26 million workers and retirees um, during the period under review from 10.22 million. And we see this was contained in the unaudited report on pension funds industry portfolio uh, for the period ended 29th of February, 2024, released by the National Pension Commission um, earlier. And citizens can now hold government officials accountable by accessing app.cdcu.gov.ng. This is an app unveiled by Office of President Tunubu, uh, Special Assistant in Policy and Coordination, Hajia Hadiza Balosman. Uh, according to the Special Assistant to the President on Public Affairs, uh, Mr. Aliu Audu, who was a guest on Business Morning, says citizens can expect real-time feedback when they share observations through the app. Take a listen. You know, the moment you go into the URL, I mean, put out that the app.cdcu.gov.ng um, installation package is sent to you. You, 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 you installed and as you provide feedback, as you provide information, there is the back end team that receives this information and follow real time. I mean, there, there, there are um, SLAs for different categories of, of information and as to how this incident, I mean, we have a, a, the, the, the CDC unit, the CDCU unit have a, co a comprehensive, um, building a comprehensive incident management unit, incident management solution that provides real time. I mean, they're going to be KPI, they're going to be SLA as to different um, queries, different information as, as to feedback that are required. The details of this will come out, especially from the guys in the, in the, in the CDC unit. But the thing, like I've said, you, you have the app, you put in the information, Go to the particular project, whatever it is, whatever part of the eight-point um, agenda of Mr. President or the deal, uh, focus of Mr. President, you you are interested in tracking up. It gives you opportunity, provide you information on them, then make room for you to provide feedback. And the the, the guys at the back get this feedback and respond in re, in, in real good time. Which is one of the features of this app is to provide real-time feedback to citizen, not um, 
feedback that will come whenever or might not come. This is actually an attempt to have like a centralized um, contact, you know, um, mechanism or platform where citizens can read government and be assured of real time feedback. I mean, this is us, like God, the president has said, using technology, using innovation to advance, you know, the, the deliverables in terms of um, governance. Well, many of the issues impacting Nigeria's economy seem to be tied predominantly to insecurity. We see food inflation. That's this at 37.92%. That was in February, which is feeding into headline inflation. Uh, we also see Nigeria's oil output that hit about 1.48 million barrels per day in February, down uh, from uh, January. Well, according to data from uh, OPEC, uh, we've seen um, oil production, you know, gradually uh, recovering, but... Uh, compared to January, we see there's a 7% um, drop there when it comes to oil production uh, in Nigeria. Well, joining us uh, now is Mr. Debayo Adeleke. He's the founder of Supply Chain Africa. Joining me right here in the studio, great to have you. Thank you so much, lad. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while, uh, definitely. And uh, happy holidays. Uh, thank you. Yes, I'm sure you've, um, I'm sure we're having to drag you out <laughs> where you should be uh, enjoying yourself. But, you know, the, the word insecurity has um, it's been with Nigeria for a while now, and it's uh, becoming um, one of those buzzwords that we were just, you know, we just get used to, you know, in this country. And it definitely impacts, you know, a lot of things um, at this time. Um, is Nigeria too big to secure, you know, in your opinion? Absolutely not. Uh, I don't think there is any objective, and I use the word objective loosely. The objective is, uh, in this particular case, is Nigeria. I don't think any objective is... Uh, uh, is too big to secure. That might be challenging in, re in securing the, the so-called objective. Uh, Nigerian geopolitical space uh, is, 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 be, I mean, is not beyond uh, being secured. Though we have some challenges in ungoverned spaces around uh, the country, but that doesn't mean that Nigeria is, uh, is too big to be secure. Some of this, uh, uh, you know, we have some architectural issues, security architectural issues that need to be revamped. Uh, I believe that we are running on uh, using the software, you know, we're running on a whole outdated software when it comes to the security architecture. And I think we are nearing the revamp of the national security conversation again, the national security architectural conversation that we need to look at holistically how to secure Nigeria because everything ties into security. Everything from food security to an health healthcare security to economic security to national security, border security, all these expressions of security, because we have about, what, 35 or 40 expressions of security. But whenever we mention the word insecurity or security, we always talk about the physical aspect of it. But there is so much aspect that is tied to the, the, the construct of what we call uh, security. And Nigeria, to be honest with you, we're not uh, we're not too big to be secured. And I think with the right people and with the right infrastructure in place and the right architecture, I think we're in a, in, a, in a good place. All right. Uh, tell me, you know, in your experience about a country that's, you know, uh, been through, you know, insecurity yes. and I've been able to actually tackle it, you yes. know, and bounce back and, you know, get their economy running. Yeah, absolutely. And, and obviously, you know, we might have forgotten maybe history. We've not done too much of historical background, but most of all the countries to where we are today actually have always had security challenges from the Great Britain to the United States. I mean, we went through all these phases of insecurity. Most of the Middle East, I mean, some of them are still going through those phases right now. There is always a time in your historical uh, kind of historical timeline whereby the, the issue of trying to understand the state uh, the state structure, how the, the country is supposed to be formed, and all those things, you know, everybody tussling for the same uh, political, uh, you know, geopolitical space, uh, everybody, those things causes insecurity. And everybody has a vested interest. When self-interest over, overwhelms uh, the community interest, it becomes a security challenge. Then over the course of time, as, you know, as things kind of unravel over time and things kind of even out or smoothen out. Some countries have been able to triumph over those challenges and some haven't. Uh, some personal interests have now prevailed over the national interest. So those are the issues that has come over the course of time, whether, whereby you see some countries that have done well with security and some that haven't. But security is always an ongoing and continuous process. It's not something that, oh, we feel secure today. Oh, Nigeria has been secured before. It hasn't been. I mean, let me break it to you straight. We've never been really secured. 
if you look at it, only that, and I think the technology and a lot of things that come to play that our increased population has really showed the fault lines in our security. We've because got, I, I know there was a time, you know, people could travel by road, you yes. know, with these, you know, without having fear, mm -hmm. you know, being either kidnapped, yes. you know, robbed. Yeah, you know, on the highway. But uh, the same question I always ask, because those incidents never happened, does that mean that we were secure back then? It's not because I believe that those those fault lines were were really not exploited. That's why we felt like, because those incidents weren't happening, that we were actually secured. They were there. They've always been there. It's only that now that people are now using those opportunities to exploit those, for, for, uh, those fault lines. And we'll be, oh, you know, we are insecure. At the same time, I also well have to mention that the, uh, the occurrences of these insecurity or some of these incidents that we've seen, that doesn't mean that, you know, work is not being done in the, in the security perspective, you know. So it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. Uh, but, you know, it's a journey. It's a journey to from, you know, being insecure to being secured. And I don't think any nation on earth can say proudly say that they are fully secured. No, it's a ever... So I guess it's, relative. it's a very relative, and you have to put it in point. context. Yeah. All right. Let, let's look at the 2024 um, budget, you know, sectoral allocation. We're seeing um, about 3.25 trillion. That's earmarked for defense and the security um, sector. If you look at the budget sectoral allocation, that's about 12 percent, you know, of the 2024 budget. Education has about 7.9 percent, single digits. Health sector, 5 percent. Infrastructure, uh, 5 percent. So defense and security is taking you know massive chunk there you know of the of the budgets for 2024 and um i guess that amount is okay i mean in, how in, should that money be spent really? uh, ideally so if you look at it because everybody has a piece of the pie because it's it's under the umbrella of security and defense that doesn't mean that other sectors doesn't have well, you mentioned healthcare healthcare security is also part of do security umbrella as well. The educational security, economic security. We have the communal security. They have political security. Uh, you have, uh, you know, there's so much aspect and expression of security that everything is all kind of encapsulated under the uh, under the security and, um, under the security umbrella. But there are certain things that I really want to highlight here, and I think I've seen it. I've seen the revamp in the in the defense industrial complex, which I've always been advocated because of our neighbors, because of our population. Nigeria is what we call the center of graffiti of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, because of that, anything that happens in Nigeria kind of changes the whole dynamics of geopolitical landscape in sub-Saharan Africa. So it is important for us to have our own defense uh, industrial complex in such a way that we don't outsource our security architecture because what has been done in the last uh, few years, at least from, from our adult life, is the fact that most of what we call security today has been outsourced to other countries. You've seen a lot of Western and Eastern influence in our country, but it's about time that we need to believe in our own abilities, that we can actually secure ourselves, we can produce enough technology, we can produce enough armament, we can produce enough to protective gear to kind of secure our men and women that are out there, you know, either on the, on the, in the Gulf of Guinea, either in the, in the forest, Boko Haram, in there, you know, doing whatever, what not to keep a nation secure. But there's so many other things that need to be done, that needs to happen as well in the nature of uh, the crime gathering of, uh, you know, the, the, the crime data gathering, which we are doing with Route Watch uh, as a platform whereby you can actually, you know, digital crime gathering, uh, you know, you can actually, you know, people can report incidents happening around them and can use those those data to be able to produce intelligence of what's really going in our community. That will actually affect policing, that will affect communal, uh, you know, security, that will affect intelligence overall. And, and of course, we're doing work on food insecurity as well, as I've discussed with you in our, in our private conversations, that these, uh, the issue of food insecurity is such an enormous tax has been going, has been plaguing Nigeria for so long. Now, if you we know, look at, the, you know, data there showing us um, countries in sub-Saharan Africa with high food inflation, yes. we see Nigeria there at 37.92%. Exactly. That's in the previous uh, inflation report. Ethiopia, that's sitting on 31.6%. Uh, Malawi, that's 42% uh, uh, right now, food inflation you know, in the Malawi, wow. Sierra Leone, 44.71%. Then we have the big one, Zimbabwe, 84.40%. Wow. That's uh, food inflation alone. Exactly. You know, at this point. So it's a big problem. But in Nigeria, we, we've heard about, you know, the farmers not, you know, be able to go to the farms at this time because of, you know, security concerns and, you know, the logistics and all of that. Um, is there any short-term solution, 
you know, you see, because we keep raising rates, you know, we see the central bank, you know, trying to tame inflation and we've raised rates about 600 basis points already in the first quarter of 2024. What do you think can be done? So you know, size rates, what, rate hikes. What is what doing is what doing well. I, and I've I've said this in over the course of time is that what we have to build this issue of how to rebuild Nigeria back big brick by brick. Nothing is going to come by miracle. And the same issue with the issue of uh, food uh, insecurity, like the project called Nigeria Food Insecurity Project, uh, is a project that we we started about gathering data. And the, the insight that I've seen so far in some of some of the work we've done is the fact that. We oversimplify this issue of food insecurity. We talked about it that we need to plant more, we need to do more agriculture. That's about 45% of the problem. We have storage issues, we have supply chain issues, transportation issues, we have uh, just taxation issues, both formal and informal, both legal and illegal. We have uh, you know, the route issues, we have the stakeholders issues. You talk about Nigerian, uh, Nigerian Union of Road Transport Workers, we have the farmers, uh, you know, the women, market women. Everyone in this so-called uh, food uh, value chain has some part to play in this, both the consumer part and whatnot. But we're so focused on the agricultural part that we believe that if we over, we continue to produce and produce. There's so many places you go to in Nigeria. I've just, I just left the Bomo show. There's so many places that you see that they, they have so much food in. There's problem with moving from place of abundance to place of scarcity, and that is one of our biggest problems. Our infrastructure is deteriorating day and night. Uh, you know, there, there, there's just so much that we don't focus on. We we focus solely on agricultural part of production, and you know, and you know, I. I Ability of the farmers not to access market. That in itself is one problem. But even the, the produce that they have, how do we get it from where they are to where it is needed? And that is a problem. I had, you know, nice bowl of, you know, jollof rice over here in Lagos, about, you know, 15,000. Then you go to Bomoche, it's about two five. That's a huge difference. Right. That's a huge, the price arbitrage. You know, and those things, and we start going about, you know, the, the cost of COVID. But I'm sure that 15,000, I'm sure that was a fancy restaurant. I know, it's normal, it's normal, it's normal. Okay. So, you know what I'm saying? So, it's, so, when you start looking at those things that price arbitrage, you're beginning to wonder why certain, why people spend almost 70% of their salary on food in Lagos, and they spend certain percentage in other parts of the country. And those are the things that we need to start having conversations about. That is how we attack food insecurity. Right. All right. What's your outlook, you know, generally for security in Nigeria at this rate, you know, we're going at this I time? I think it's all hand on deck. Uh, I believe uh, the way things are going right now, the, we've always showed that we've always kind of, through our vote, we've given the responsibility of security to the government. But over the course of time, we realize that government and government alone cannot do it. Every hands on deck, the business community, the academic community, and the, the government has to work hand in hand. I just left the promotion, like I told you, we just started uh, the supply chain research and innovation center over there with a group of, uh, with Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Razak, uh, and uh, Kalilu over there, and, uh, you know, the Department of Management Studies, Professor Remy, uh, you know, uh, Professor Remy, uh, Awo Remy, and, uh, you know, Mr. Niyi. Abiri and all those guys helping us to start this initiative whereby we can start having research focused solutions whereby um, the, the industry, the business industry, the academia and the government can come together and proffer solutions in the area of security, supply chains, because they're all interlinked. They are very, very interlinked. You can't have one without the other. And I believe without us working together, we cannot leave all these responsibilities for government alone. Everyone has to get involved. The people that are being secured and the people that are providing that security blanket, everybody has to work together to make sure that the solution that has been proffered is a solution that makes sense. And we need to start believing in ourselves that our solution can solve that. We cannot bring other people. Nobody will help build this nation. Nobody has the best interest of this nation than the people in it already. So if you think others will they have the best interest at heart, you're brilliant. I guess you're nobody's going to come save you Absolutely at not. this point. Absolutely. Thank not. you so much. It's great having your perspective. I'm Sir Debaya Deleke is the founder of Supply Chain Africa. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll take a break now. When we come back, we head straight to the markets. That's in a moment. Just stay with us.
All right, it's time to jump uh, right into the markets. And we see um, it's earnings uh, season, uh, Daphne. We've been talking about uh, most of the 2023 audited full year results, but um, a, a listed company is moving really fast, you know, at this time, already having the Q1 um, uh, results uh, for 2024. And that's talking about um, Gary Gross in there. So um, their uh, revenue actually sold by 254%. They're, they're the first to um, get this out now. Their earnings is March um, 31st, 2024. Revenue, that's 50 uh, 0.42 uh, billion uh, from 14.23 uh, billion earlier. See operating profit. Um, that's also um, up, you know, compared to um, the previous year. So uh, they're really fast, you know. At this point, Anita is going to give us the details now. Um, Anita, uh, great to have you. And I'm wondering, you know, being the first, you know, to um, get out your your earnings for the first quarter of mm. 2024. Um, why are they so fast <laughs> at this mm. point? 2023 audited earnings, they were also the first to mm -hmm. release that um, uh, report. And I'm wondering um, why the speed, you know, getting these results out so well, early. Laddie, it's not just about the speed, but also when you take a look at the performance, it was a stellar performance. Some call it blistering, some call it um, outstanding. And of course, when you take a look at the um, Gerugu Power, which is the first um, power, uh, power company to be listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange that was listed on, um, on October the 5th, 2022, just about, uh, about two years ago. And then it came in at 100 naira per share. But at the close of this week on Monday, at the close of uh, Monday's trading session, it's, uh, guess what, the price is at about 1,000 naira. And when so, I saw that price, I was quite surprised. Exactly. Um, uh, we, I, we were talking at the back end. I had hundreds, you know, in my mind, but to see that a thousand mm. naira per share, yeah. that's uh, quite a run. So, so it's really an impressive, um, uh, impressive performance. And of course, the, the investors there are really smiling to the bank because at the last AGM that they had in March, they declared a, a, a dividend of 20 billion naira for the existing shareholders. And that, that translates to about eight naira uh, uh, per ordinary shares of 50 cover each. So that means that uh, where you put your money in Girigu, um, you, you, you've, made, you've made multiple amounts of that. And of course, being the first, like you just mentioned, it's the first and then also with a, a, an impressive performance, which also would rub on on the right. on the performance. I'm of, definitely going to be looking out for how this impacts um, trading that's opening on on Friday. On Friday, on Friday. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna see how this is gonna well, play well, out. Well, there's there's so much to look out for for right. trading uh, trading on on Friday, which initially we'd expected to have opened on. Uh, Thursday, which is uh, tomorrow. But uh, when you look at this, uh, I, I'm sure if you were an investor there, you definitely would be right. smiling to the bank. All right, I'll be uh, looking out for other, you know, uh, mm. reports there for the first quarter from other listed mm. um, companies. But we already have this one. I'll be waiting to see exactly. if we have other impressive mm. uh, reports coming out uh, sooner. Or, or later. I'll, I'll call it blowouts. And of course, uh, definitely, I wish I was an investor there. But I think, uh, <laughs> let, let me stick to, to the analysis side of the market. Now, the Nigeria's uh, market still observing a second day of a uh, um, uh, break for the Eid Festival, Edo Futter, uh, but it's being celebrated across the world, across the mus Muslim world. So Nigeria's stock market, this is still Monday's figure, which was still tracking, which was still holding on to 103,000. So just almost, if it's a give and take, if, go, if it goes further in the red, it will be Maybe a little bit lower, be below the uh, 103,000 points, which of course we were, we were initially at 104,000 points, but now we're still just a little bit holding uh, to the 103,000 points. So that's it for Niger, for the Nigerian stock market. But for the Johannesburg stock market, it was the only market to trade for today because the, it's, it's other counterparts we, which we track where they're also observing a public holiday. So for the JSC, uh, the JSC it was more slightly above um, half of a percent, 0.51% at intraday. So that's for the JSC uh, stock market. Now, also, let's take a look at uh, for the other markets on the uh, African continent. The, uh, the Egypt Stock Exchange, we're still saying, uh, talking about the Monday, Monday close, it's a, it's, a, it's a mostly Islamic country. So it's observing the aid festival. Of course, other, other, other countries around um, um, on some parts of Africa uh, will, will also have an extended holiday, uh, holiday period between now and possibly tomorrow if maybe there's an extension because there's been so much extension around the Muslim world. For the Kenyan stock exchange uh, for Tuesday, it was in the red 1.06% has been maintaining that decline, which we, we've been seeing for a couple of days now. Now, let's talk about the for, the... for the Middle Eastern market, we wouldn't have that because 
there across across all that market across the United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, and uh, the, the Qatar. Those markets where we track, they're also on holiday, so we don't have anything to talk about that market except that they're on holiday. Now, let's move over to the world's biggest economy, where stock futures, they, they rose marginally um, for, for early, uh, early today, and that's because our investors are eyeing out, are putting their eyes out for the U.S. inflation data, which is expected to come in uh, uh, with a 0.3% increase month on month in March, uh, and then 3.4% uh, year on year within the 12 months earlier. And that's according to a poll by economists, uh, polled by Dow Jones, um, uh, Dow Jones economists. So, uh, of course, they're saying that this, which ex excludes volatile uh, food and energy prices, is expected to rise to this amount uh, on, the, on the back of that. But for the, uh, for the, the, uh, the, the markets, the futures, this is how it printed just a couple of uh, hours ago, 0.02% for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500, 0.14% in the green, and the NASDAQ, 0.32% in the green. So now, that's uh, talking about the U.S. market. Now, if this inflation, inflation report if it's coming in, it could add to concerns about the rates remaining uh, elevated for longer, while a cooler than expected inflation uh, could prompt investors to believe that the Fed would cut the rates in the coming months. But what are we to look out for? We're also looking at uh, the, the earnings season for the first quarter, which is about to kick off. And the minutes from the Fed's latest meetings are also due out later today and will provide additional insight into policymakers thinking about the expectation for the, the, the country's economy and the monetary policy. Now, for the overnight market, uh, for your overnight performance of Wall Street, where we saw that the three major averages ended mixed ahead of the CPI report. But for more details about that, let's have our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird, with the details of Tuesday's closing, for, uh, closing performance for Wall Street. The U.S. stock market was uneventful on Tuesday, as some early bouncing around, but everything seemed to be quite settled on Tuesday. As the Dow Jones almost flatlined down at 0.02%, the S&P 500 slightly up at 0.1%, and the heavy tech Nasdaq up at 0.3%. This is all as investors are waiting to see how the consumer index report will be released and what it will say. There is much expectation that this will have light on the inflation rate in the U.S., this light that it might shed on the inflation rate could have a dramatic impact on U.S. interest rates. This is all coming up on Wednesday, as many investors are watching and waiting to see how the U.S. economy is faring out as it relates to inflation. Our Washington correspondent Mario Bird with um, the closing performance on Wall Street for Tuesday. Now, let's talk about the Asian market. Uh, where we have the second, the world's second biggest economy on that, on that, within that region, that's China. But when we took a, take a look at the performance for the regional sectors, uh, for, for the regional indexes, uh, the Nikkei still in the red, 0.48%, and still tottering in between the 39 and um, 40,000 level, but it's still within, still falling below the 39,000 points if you have a, 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 a closer x ray on that. For the Kospi South, for the, for the, um, South Korea's index, the, the, the market is actually on holiday, but it closed earlier today at about 0.46% in the red, while the Hang Seng index, 1.85%, uh, making, making some kind of a comeback for that market. Over to the other side of the market, we see the Shanghai 0.70% in the red, while this, uh, uh, the Australia's uh, ASX 200, the top 200 companies on the, the Australian stock market, with a, well, they made about a 0.31% uh, increase. Now, when you talk about the, the Japan's um, uh, corporate inflation rate, it came in at about 0.8%. That's in March, and that's the third straight uh, month of increase. And is in line with expectations from a Reuters poll of economists. They were, they were expecting that, while investors are also bracing for the U.S. Consumer Price Index report, which we've been talking about. All eyes on the U.S. inflation report. So, and of course, we, we looked up at the world's biggest economy. I mentioned that um, we, we had our focus on the, US, the, on, on the Chinese economy. That's the second biggest economy. Fitch has downgraded the country's economic outlook to negative, uh, citing uh, growth, uh, uh, growth risk. Uh, that's, this is uh, um, risk to the, the, to, to the public finances as a comp uh, the economy is facing an increasing uncertainty in the shift to new growth models. At the same time, 
Moody's had sometime in December also downgraded the country's uh, economy. So, Ladi, uh, is, there's much to be concerned about um, uh, China's economy. Of course, the property market not doing too well. Yeah, and definitely once. Um China sneezes, most of these commodities actually mm. catch a cold. Mm. Uh, you know, looking at the oil market, you know, and other major commodities even mm. that we track at this time. But yeah, the most second. importantly, uh, that um, oil market you mm. know, reacts a lot to, you know, China demand and prospects, you know, of China um, demand going forward. But uh, in the U.S. now, that CPI data mm. uh, for March, every investor, you all know, the global it. market now, they're all, all looking out for that data. Mm. If it comes out hotter than expected, then mm. maybe we might just say bye-bye uh, to rate cuts, you know, in the U.S. in 2024. But I know most of those um, experts are still quite, you know, optimistic that we might actually get, you know, that rate cut, the first one, you know, in the U.S., uh, maybe in 2024. But we're we'll definitely looking out for that. Yeah, Thank yeah. you so all much. Eyes, um, all eyes, all eyes. Um, global markets, the eyes, the sign of all, of all of all eyes is on that market. So, yeah. Randy, you and I will also keep tabs on Yeah, that definitely. Market. We're tracking that right here. Uh, so, let's uh, take it on to um, London now. We have Juliana join us from our London studio. We see, um, great to have you, Juliana. So, we see U.S. Um, licensed uh, partner, that's OSL. Um, they're eyeing Ted Baker's uh, UK arm. And, and I believe OSL was appointed to run, you know, Ted Baker's U.S. retail business just um, over uh, two, uh, a year ago. Well, what are you hearing about this? That's absolutely right. Good afternoon, Laddie. And I'd like to wish our viewers a happy Eid, those who happy are celebrating um, it. Sorry, I've got, I've got a couple of voices in my ear, but I am speaking to you, Laddie, and our viewers about Ted Baker, which um, is in trouble. They announced a couple of weeks ago that they would be going into administration and since then there has been um, a lot of um, competitors trying to take the intellectual property of the business and as you said ODL which has been running their American business for about a year now they appear to be the front runner. Um, this hasn't been confirmed but this is according to a report which was uh, put out by Sky News earlier um, today and it actually follows um, a report uh, that was produced in the Sunday Times suggesting that perhaps the Fraser Group, which is run by Mike Ashley and Next, which has become pretty much an outlier when it comes to uh, British retail and the high street, they too have an interest in the business. And what's quite interesting is that Next already um, have the intellectual property rights um, for Ted Baker's lingerie and their baby wear. So Ted Baker, maybe not a popular brand outside of Britain and Europe, but in the UK, it was considered um, a staple retailer, quite pricey, um, I would say, not up to a designer luxury labels, but certainly you'd have to spend about £100 if you wanted to get um, a decent um, piece of clothing from that store. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why it's been so difficult for them. Since the founder stepped down in 2019, they've struggled ever since. His successor left in December because there was some accounting errors. Um, they were once listed in the UK stock market. They've since um, been demoted several times and they've been in trouble. So what we do know um, is that I believe they have about 9,000 staff. 200 of them have unfortunately lost their jobs this week because there was an announcement that whatever happens, who Whoever takes over at least 100 stores in the UK will be closing and you know as we've been discussing over the past couple of years laddie the high street in Britain is ever changing ever evolving it is becoming increasingly difficult for even some big names to keep up with the likes of Amazon and fast fashion brands which you know you can order from your phone in the day and you can get the outfit at night at a cut price cost. So yes, they're all trying to stay afloat. But as you were saying, the latest news is, is that OSL, who's already running uh, Ted Baker's American unit, are the front runners and taking over this historic business. Right. Definitely still a developing story. I will keep um, uh, tracking that. But it's uh, it's still, you know, earnings uh, season um, right now. We see uh, Tesco, uh, I said the profits um, up about 300 million pounds um, compared to a year um, earlier, I guess, um, thanks to inflation. Yeah, Tesco have had an amazing run. They have um, 
put out their trading results, as you said, we're bang in the middle of trading um, results season at the moment. And Tesco have proven this morning why, you know, they are Britain's biggest retailer. I think they've got a market share of about 27% of Britain's grocery um, sector, which is good because, of course, over the past couple of years, we have had um, industry um likes of Lidl and Aldi, which are European stores, come in, they're discounted stores. So there was a, a time when a lot of bosses at Tesco were pretty uh, frightened of these younger uh, retailers. But, you know, they've shown that they have proven um, supreme when it comes to the battle of uh, the Tesco, um, te the battle of Britain's grocery market. So as you were saying, they have reported their last year results and they've come in with revenue reaching 68.2 billion pounds. That's a 6.8% year on year jump. And I think really this is about the competitiveness, as I've said about 10 times already in the past minute. Um, and really, this is about inflation. We know that one of the big draggers of inflation, as you've been discussing with Agnete this week, is food. And food price inflation was really high at one point. I believe it was in double digits at about 17%. We then had the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, hauling in um, the bosses of Britain's biggest supermarkets, basically saying they've got to cut prices. All of the prices that they're seeing reducing at wholesale level needs to be trickled down to the consumers. And they listened and Tesco have benefited from that. They also have this club card membership scheme. So basically, if you've got one of these club cards, you can get an extra 25p or 10 pence off a loaf of bread, but that has proven really popular. They announced that they've got about 2.2 million households using their membership club card. So it's a good story. And um, yesterday I was reporting to you that um, retail sales in the month of uh, March had jumped 3.2% month on month. And I think this is a strong indicator of that and suggests that perhaps on Friday, when we do look at GDP figures for the month of February, it could be uh, pretty high. Yeah, definitely a strong um, indicator there. But how's all of this impacting the markets in the UK? Markets are looking good. Tip top shape at intraday. The all shares up, laddie. It's up by 0.61%. FTSE 100, the blue chip index, that's up by 0.56%. And the FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's up by 0.84%. In currencies, the British pound is trading up against the US dollar by 0.13% to the pound is up to against the euro by 0.11% and up against the Japanese yen by 0.18%. As you were saying, we're all waiting for what the CPI data is going to be um, out of the US. And more importantly, we want to hear, you know, what their outlook is going to be on the global economy. Right. And that's, I guess it's a rate cut, you know, or not in 2024. Thank you so much, uh, Julianne, for the update. All right, let's take it on to Europe now. See, the European Court of Human Rights uh, delivered a ruling in a group of um, landmark climate change uh, cases aimed at making national governments uh, meet treaty obligations to cut greenhouse emissions. Well, join us now is our DW correspondent, Jibanda Jumbelu in Berlin. I'm um, great to have you, Chip. So bring us up to speed on what happened. Thanks for having me. Well, Laddie, the European Court of Human Rights delivered rulings in three cases that aimed at making governments more accountable when it comes to climate protection. In one of them, the European Court upheld a complaint by a group of elderly Swiss women. They said that their government had violated their human rights by failing to meet emissions reduction targets. The older women said they were at a higher risk of dying during heat waves. So they demanded a ruling that would slash fossil fuel emissions at a quicker pace than planned. Now, this ruling is important because it makes a link between human rights and inadequate government action on climate protection. It is a decision that could potentially force governments to up their game on tackling climate change. But there was some disappointment in two other rulings. In one, the court referred the case back to the Portuguese courts, and another case was dismissed. Now that's because the mayor who had submitted the lawsuit against the French government no longer lives in the country. All right, are, are European governments taking enough action to fight climate change? Well, there's obviously a mismatch between the targets governments are setting and what they are delivering. 
Otherwise, the European Court of Human Rights would have potentially sided with the Swiss government. The consensus among scientists and climate protection advocates is that governments aren't doing enough. Europe is one of the continents where temperatures are rising at a quicker pace, and we've seen heat waves and more droughts across the continent in recent years. And of course, that is also having a major impact on agriculture in particular. Scientists say the current measures that European governments have currently would lead to a three degree rise in global temperatures. And that is much higher than the Paris Agreement target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. There is no day to phase out fossil fuels yet here in Europe. And that is something that scientists have been calling for. Instead, European governments appear to be relying on techno technological interventions to lower emissions, like carbon capture storage, for instance. All right, what's playing in the markets in Europe? Well, Laddie, European stocks are expected to trade higher today. Investors will be looking out for the eagerly awaited U.S. inflation data for March. If the rate is much higher than the 3.2% in February, it would dash hopes that the U.S. central bank will begin monetary easing. And in corporate news, Germany's biggest car maker, Volkswagen, will publish its sales figures for March and the first quarter of this year. Now, in the first two months of the year, Europe's biggest car maker sold 1.3 million vehicles. Now, that is 6% more than during the same period last year. All right, thank you, Chip, for the updates uh, in Europe. Uh, let's look at our stories now. See, South Africa's um, unemployment rate uh, remains among the highest in the world, according to Statistics South Africa. In the first quarter of 2024, uh, with 21,000 jobs uh, lost. Meanwhile, some entrepreneurs in Johannesburg believe the township economy has the potential to reduce the country's high unemployment rate. Our South Africa respondent, Innocent Mercer, has more. Well, it's often said that entrepreneurship is vitally important for every economy, but they often face many challenges, be it crippling economy, weak currency, and lack of funding. 39-year-old Msizi Gombi has been running a mobile kitchen for the past five years. He firmly believes in the potential of the township economy to alleviate the country's high unemployment rate. Certainly it does. Um, it's only that uh, most uh, entrepreneurs in the township have uh, valued themselves and um, thought of themselves being small and medium enterprises. But nobody wants to be small. As small as I am today, I don't wish to continue to be small. So we can create employment, we can create opportunities for um, joint ventures, partnerships. With half of South Africa's population living in the estimated 532 townships around the country, businesswoman Lesejo Sanelo says vast potential lies in the so-called township economy. Let's come together, but understanding that the solutions reside with us, within us, and we ourselves are the Indunas, are the Lakotas, you know, because that's what it is. Um, and often we think because it's this eloquent English it actually isn't what happens within our communities, whereas in fact, the systems mirror each other. The only difference is that the one is regulated and the other is self-regulated. Why don't we um, industrialize our very own communities? Who says it's not possible? You know, the capital resides within our own communities. So it's about shifting the paradigm in saying it's not as bad as we think because actually, the solutions reside within us as a people. According to Lesejo, South Africa's efforts to develop townships face many challenges. The gap resides in implementation. We're very good at formulating policies that are among the world's renowned. We're not so good at executing. Entrepreneur Lerato Sanelo encourages fellow entrepreneurs to persist and persevere. So anyone in the township, the start for me, is believe in your business, believe in yourself. And once that, that is the foundation, everything else can sort of start to fall into place. And the last thing that I realized, once that happens, you start to draw the right people. Um, and we need to stop looking at the solutions from the people that are way up there, you know. In a country with an unemployment rate of over 32%, some believe that the informal sector is a lifeline to countless families who lack formal employment. 
Meanwhile, Nsizi's aspiration to franchise his business continues. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channels Television News. All right, thank you, Innocent. Well, the Ghanaian uh, Finance uh, Ministry has announced that Ms. Julie Siam is taking up the position of Commissioner General at the Ghana Revenue Authority, marking the first time a woman has assumed this role. Ms. Siam uh, brings a wealth of experience to the role, having previously served as a commissioner uh, responsible for the Support Services Division within uh, the GRA. Her professional background includes significant tenor as a group executive at the Echo Bank Group, who have seen operations across 40 countries spanning North America, Europe, Africa, and other regions. And to East Africa now, World Bank has reported uh, that April, that's in April, that uh, Ghana's economy, that's um, going to grow by 5% in 2024, about 5.2% in 2025 to 2026. Uh, Delenda highlighted other growth drivers, including the recovery in agriculture and tourism, as well as deeper regional integration. The report cited the $1.5 billion international bond Kenya issued in February 2024 as a major contributor to the growth of the shilling as the shillings value and the economy. You know, Kenya issued international bonds in response to uh, euro bonds and commercial loans falling due. Uh, this increased the commercial bank's foreign currency reserve. Uh, Uganda's government has moved to pass legislation allowing Islamic banking and the immediate licensing of Salam Bank, signaling a growing demand for Sharia compliant financial services and products. According to the East African uh, Salam Bank, a, a subsidiary of Djibouti-based lender, it goes by the name, um, officially opened its doors in Kampala last month, highlighting expert remarks which cited a growing niche uh, in need of such services. The country now joins other regional economies like Kenya and Tanzania, which have taken the same uh, routes by adopting financial services and products that are Sharia compliant in their country. All right, let's get a check on the crypto market now, get some um, headlines uh, coming out um, right now. But we're seeing red uh, on the screen in um, the crypto market with Bitcoin uh, down about 2.3%, Ethereum 3.36%, pullback there. Even though we see Ethereum was looking um, good at this time yesterday, XRP is in the green. Uh, surprisingly, BNB is also in the green, but deep red for Matic. Um, dot near protocol and uh, internet uh, computer. Let's look at the sentiment in the market now. Still, we know it's still a very uh, greedy market, even though we're seeing a pullback, extreme greed, 78 points, um, lagging effects, uh, lagging um, impact. Now, let's look at the top stories now in the crypto market. We see um, a report by KPMG showing that German investor confidence has returned in the crypto market. The German investors are showing uh, renewed optimism and confidence. Um, the study revealed um, following last year's market um, challenges and, and, and showing that, you know, right now, some of the countries that they track in Europe, Germany being um, one of them, about 2,400 um, were surveyed, you know, some private crypto investors. Um, and the, the survey did show that most of the investors are getting uh, bullish again, you know, in the crypto market. Then we see MetaMask, um, they're going to allow um, users check their airdrop eligibility. We know airdrops are really uh, big, you know, right now in the crypto market. Everyone's trying to get an, uh, get an airdrop, you know, at this time. And that's how most of these um, platforms that are coming up, you know, get users to engage on their blockchain and uh, they reward them, you know, for the work done by giving them, you know, some of these um, airdrops. And we see Shiba Inu, and that's one of the um, top meme, uh, meme coins in the market. It's hit uh, 4 million total addresses at this time, showing that wallets that are holding um, Shiba Inu, the, the token, there are about 4 million of them. It's a big milestone um, for that uh, meme uh, project. No, it's all about meme coins right now, you know, in the crypto space. All right, let's bring in Solomon Amunde now to bring us up to speed on what's going on. Um, great to have you, Solomon. Yeah, great to have you, Laddie. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Yes, uh, good afternoon. So, you know, it's all about uh, the ETF right now. That's um, gotten a lot of attention from, you know, 2023 into 2024. But we're seeing reports that it's cooling. There's demand in the U.S. for uh, most of these ETFs are cooling. How are you seeing this? So, so it was uh, only a matter of time um, because um, we saw 
um, huge expectations from most of the persons that got in very early from late last year up until first quarter of um, this year. And to be told, they have made them um, good profits. Most persons are up 50%. So it's only natural for demand to slow down a bit. So I believe that is what is happening. It's almost impossible to expect to keep seeing the same volume that we've been seeing for the past three months. So I would say what we are seeing right now is natural. Most investors that are up in profits, they will start taking profits and um, we'll begin to see some form of outflow, which we have already started seeing in the ETFs like um, Grayscale Gray ETF, the GBTC ETF, saw about $300 million outflow. That was about it yesterday. So we'll keep seeing something like this happening. Last week, we saw um, ARK Invest. They saw almost $80 million outflow, which was like the highest as of last week. But this week, we have seen a new all-time high in terms of outflow, which is over $300 million. So we should expect to see more of this over the next few weeks or thereabouts. Right. And how do these outflows, you know, from the ETF, how do they impact, you know, the price of Bitcoin? We've seen Bitcoin um, down, losing that 70 k level uh, this afternoon. Yeah, so, so the outflow just um, majorly means that people are taking profits, obviously. So it's more like people are selling um, their Bitcoins because um, if we remember vividly, um, last month we saw lots of inflow. We're seeing, we're easily seeing almost a billion dollar inflow on the ETFs which kept pumping the price of Bitcoin. And we saw it hit about $74,000, 74 k plus last month. So it was majorly because of the ETF inflows. That's what has been pumping the price. So once we start seeing more outflows, it's only logical that Bitcoin will start crashing, most likely below $40,000. Below $40,000. That's, that's quite a big, big, big uh, drop there. Uh, we're seeing uh, yeah. that uh, according to... Um, Solomon, but looking at the, the meme coin season at this time, um, does it remain strong in the short term? Short term, it's no longer strong. Um, meme coins have performed tremendously well this year. I mean, we've seen people easily flip $1,000 to over a million dollars with multiple meme coins. I mean, meme coins have, this year is like the best year for meme coins in the whole crypto ecosystem. This year has been the best year for meme coins, not just on Solana, but on other blockchains to Ethereum, base and all. So right now, I would say people are taking profits aggressively from meme coins. All right. Lots of profit. Okay. I guess it's profit taking time. Thank you so much, uh, Solomon Monday. Always great having your perspective. Thank you very much, Lenny. All right, so that's how the market is uh, looking uh, today. Definitely trading starts right here for the local boss. Um, that's on Friday. We'll definitely be tracking how the market uh, plays out for the first trading or the second trading day uh, for this week. So that's the show. Um, thank you so much for watching. Remember, you can visit uh, www.channelcv.com for more updates. You can also watch this again on our YouTube channel. From me and the team right here at Channels HQ, it's bye for now.